Hello folks, and welcome back to Behind Schedule and Over Budget, the show where your 3D printer mysteriously fails from a glitch just when you're printing that last part you need to finish your redesign. So, uh, welcome back. It's been a while since I posted a video. Uh, my first four episodes of the show were all dropped at the same time. Um, so this is episode five. Um, yeah, and it is, it's great to be back. So, in today's episode, we're going to discuss the power supply for the Grizz Sextant system. But before we get into the power supply, I think it's worth we discuss the status of this entire project. Because the Venn diagram of project status and power supply status is a circle. Uh, essentially, the, the original power supply I picked for the system turned out to be a little undersized, um, and it isn't doing exactly what I wanted to do. So the system is kind of feature limited at the moment. So the last two weeks, you know, ever since I've released this project online, have seen me trying to replace that power supply with a better option so that I can get hit the features that I want and get this project actually ready to release. Um, so again, a word about the project release. Again, if you're uh, if you're here watching this channel, that means you've already seen the Grizz Sextant on um, on whatever subreddit was nice enough to not downvote it, and whatever website was bored enough to write an article about it. So again, welcome to the channel. It is great to have you here. Um, I'm glad you're interested. And again, when I started this little endeavor, I wouldn't have even imagined I'd get 200 subscribers. I thought this was just mostly going to be me talking to a wall. So. Um, but if you're here, that means you're excited about this project and you probably might want a chance to build your own. Um, and I think the one mistake that I've made, um, having released this project online and don't get me wrong, I, I am really happy with the response it got, you know, all the comments were great. Um, you know, sort of a few dicks, but not many. Um, so all the comments were great. I'm very happy with the response, but personally, I made a bit of a mistake when releasing this project, which was not having the design files ready when I put it online. Um, now that it's been online and it's had its 15 seconds of fame, um, it just means that anybody who's going to come and see this project with fresh eyes and might want a chance to build it has probably missed a small window to actually navigate their way to whatever website the files will be hosted on. Uh, but regardless, you know, I'm sure people will still find it in the future. And if you're here watching this channel, that means you're interested. And you might want the files and I want to get them to you. So with that out of the way, again, what we need to do is fix the power supply. And with the power supply fixed, we should have a finished project that can be released. So do know that that is my number one priority right now with any side projects I'm doing is fixing this power supply and closing up this project. I want to get it in your hands. I want to see what anybody out there in the community will do, do with it you know, what, um, you know, and what improvements they'll make to it. So without further ado, let's talk about power supplies. But before we do that, just a quick warning. So I probably stated in the past that my background is mechanical engineering, not electrical engineering. So, um, I want you to take whatever I'm going to say in this, in this video with a few grains of salt. Okay. Um, I try not to mislead people. I try to do the, my, my best research before I talk on anything, but I'm not an authority on this subject matter. So please, you know, this is, this is electronics we're talking about. This is batteries. This can be dangerous. I'm doing my best to learn what needs to be learned um, and implement it. And I'm going to communicate it to you, but please, by all means, if anything sounds dangerous coming from here or anything sounds wrong, let me know and take some, you know, take a little bit of caution as you go into any of this stuff. All right. So. First off, let's take a deeper dive into what we wanted out of a power supply for the Grizz Sextant system. You know, what was an ideal power supply? So first of all, we need power. We need to run the system. That means a sufficient, sufficient capacity with overhead. So we want to be able to supply five volts at least, more than likely like plus five volts or greater than five volts, 5.2, 5.3 volts. Um, and we need the proper, uh, you know, we need the proper uh, amperage output. So those two combined is the wattage for our system. Um, the system itself uses about one amp, um, but if we have a system that could put out roughly two amps would be preferred. That would give us at least an extra 100% overhead to handle any uh, power surges from the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we want a reliable power supply. We want something that isn't going to brown out and cause your computer to shut down. Um, and we want a safe power supply. You know, I That's a big thing for me when I'm working with electronics is that I want something that's vetted. Okay, like I just said in the previous slide, I'm not an expert on this. So, you know, if you're an electrical engineer, you probably might be able to cook up something yourself that'll work well. But as for me, I'm going to need something closer to off the shelf that's well vetted. Something that provides, you know, just like we see here, 
overcurrent protection, short circuit protection, low high voltage protection, both for output and charging, you know, just all kinds of features like that. Um, the next most important thing is for the power supply system as a whole is that we like options. Um, much like any modern device today, we want two main options. We want portability, we want batteries. We want a bat, and in the case of the batteries, we'd like a battery life of greater than three hours. I mean, all, all things considered, I actually like greater than five hours, but we'll see what we can do. And we also want the option for wall power for extended use. So if you're going to be sitting down with the Grizz Sexton and using it for extended periods, which is something that I actually look forward to doing, um, you want the option to plug it into the wall and not have to worry about the battery, you know, maybe even charge the battery at the same time. So again, that's actually how I, I see myself using, you know, my own unit in the future. Beyond that, we want power management. So we have power, we have power options, and we need to manage those options. So the first thing you want, one of the nicest things to have is power pass through. That means that we can take the wall power fed into, or that's uh, inputted into the system and feed that directly to the system um, while simultaneously charging the battery. And that also means that we would need a wall power supply with sufficient capacity to do both of those things. Um, which, you know, that'll come into play in a little bit, but essentially what that means is that if we have the wall power plugged in, we want to prioritize wall power to the system. That makes, I think that makes the most sense. And I think that's the way most systems will handle it. Um, again, next thing we want is battery charging. So it, if possible, we would like a complete system that will handle the charging of the batteries. That's smart, safe charging management. Um, another important thing is enable functionality. You know, it sounds crazy, but like sometimes it's hard to find a system that actually has a power switch on it, um, or at least one that's broken out in, a, in an easy to manage way. So we want something with a simple enable disable uh, functionality. Um, and if possible, something that can communicate system status. You know, something that can, um, over some communication protocol, give us the status of the battery that we can use in the future, that would be awesome. So that is an ideal power system, again, Sufficient capacity, um, two options, battery or wall power. And then above that, we want to manage those two options. We want to prioritize wall power when it's available, um, you know, to, to um, power the system and charge the battery at the same time. And we want to well manage how that battery is going to be charged. So before we get into the next options that I'm looking at, uh, let's take a look at the actual system power. So I've already done a few tests on the system and I essentially have it tested out at about one to one and a quarter amps of, uh, of current draw at five volts. Uh, that's about 600 milliamps for the display and 400 milliamps for the Raspberry Pi. That, that current is measured on an old uh, original Model B Pi that I had laying around. Um, I'd imagine, or I'm sure the Pi 3 Model B that I intend to use will draw more current but overall having tested both raspberry pis in the system their current draw is actually pretty similar running both the emulators that i've run on there and the uh, the uh, debian operating system i believe so i really think that one to one and a quarter amps is a decent target to hit for any uh, power supply system we're going to be working with here um obviously we might be able to might need to expect more but i think you know just this system might have to be planned for just low um low load usages you know if the if you're really going to stress the raspberry pi you may have to look forward to a, a brownout but maybe not uh, all depends on what system or power supply system winds up in here and again beyond that there will be a little more system overhead for the sound for the sound and um, i think the keyboard's power draw is negligible on the order of milliamps so the current solution as designed in the gris accent that you may have seen online is a PowerBoost 1000C paired with a 4400 milliamp hour battery and a, a little slide switch for enable because the PowerBoost actually has an enable functionality built into it. Um, the PowerBoost provides 5.2 volt power for the system. It steps up the 3.7 volts from the lithium ion battery to 5.2. Um, it, it actually does provide power pass through. So when the wall charger is plugged in, um, it will prioritize that power to the system and then essentially draw more power from the wall in order to charge the battery. Um, they, uh, Adafruit specs the output rating of the system at one amp plus, which is kind of a, a neat way of saying, you know, after one amp, you're on your own, um, and also one amp charging rate. Uh, and this entire system cost about $50 total, which was, you know, not bad as far as the bill material was concerned. 
So what is the issue? Because essentially this system here, um, which is again why I kind of chose it, does everything I need it to do. Um, the issue is that when I tried to power this with the Raspberry Pi 3, I began to get brownouts. Um, you know, it just doesn't seem to have the output capacity to handle that extra load. I think I'm on the ragged edge of the capacity of this system. So from what I've tested, and feel free to disagree with me, I'd really like to know your input here, but from my tests, it seems that this system is undersized for the current application. And one of the biggest problems seems to be that big uh, seven inch display. You know, that's the largest display I've ever used in a project before. It eats up 600 milliamps, it's, it's power hungry. So again, I think we are pushing past the limits of a system like this. We're going to have to go find something else. Now, what might that something else be? Well, let's take a look at what I've been testing so far. So first thing, it's a power bank. Um, I've seen plenty of cyber deck builds that use power banks, um, and they seem to do the job in many, in many cases. So this here shown is a power bank that I've purchased and tested um, and tested well in the system. It is a, it's made by Wolfalo and it's a 10,000 or 10 amp hour battery. Um, it's output as measured is 5.2 volts. It's small enough to fit in the system. And I've actually done a redesign of the system to fit this battery. Uh, it does provide power pass through. Um, it has a pretty high current capacity, auto on off. So we can kind of handle an on off functionality and it only costs $30. So again, it's close to a perfect system. Um, and again, I have actually tested this with the Raspberry Pi 3 and the entire system running on it uh, for five plus hours with very minimal issues. You know, you will get the low voltage um, or the low power warning on the Raspberry Pi operating system, but overall it ran five hours with me running some programs in the background and it worked pretty well. So what is the issue? Well, there's one small catch. When you go in the power pass through mode, when you plug in the wall power, the output power from the USB jacks drops to 4.8 volts, um, which is low enough after you take, in the, take into account further voltage drops trying to get that voltage to the system to cause the system to brown out, which is a real shame because I think this would have been a great option. Um, but if anything, it is at, it, with the power pass through considered, it is at or worse than the um, functionality of the Adafruit system. Um, it, kind of the opposite problem. The Adafruit system is low powered in battery mode, and this is actually low powered in wall power mode, sadly. Um, I don't know what's going on inside of the system that causes such a volt, like, it causes up, upwards of half of a volt, a voltage drop. Um, but again, that's the sad, the sad portion of this. Um, this, as far as I can tell, can't be used the way I want it to be used. I think this could be used in a situation where this is placed inside of the unit, and then if you want to charge it, you can take it out of the unit, um, but or as a battery-only unit. Um, but again, it's not the perfect solution. And as, as far as it being a battery-only unit, I did look at an idea of having it um, paired with the wall power, essentially having two separate power inputs to the system. Um, so that's another alternate solution here. How can we get wall power in um, as a separate input than the battery? And the way I wanted to do that as shown was with a double pull, double throw switch. So we put system plus and minus on the uh, poles, and then we put the wall and battery uh, pluses and wall and battery minuses on the throws, which means that this will act as a changeover switch that'll change us from one input to the other. We can switch from wall power or battery power to the system. Um, it does provide complete power switching. Uh, what it doesn't have as far as I've laid it out in the system is a way to actually charge the battery inside of the unit. My plan was that there'd be a battery door and the battery could be removed with a little um, umbilical cord that could be taken off, uh, which is again, um, a little awkward. I think there actually would have been ways to uh, have a dedicated power jack for the battery, um, but it's just started, the, the, the architecture of this started to get very awkward. Um, and the other thing is that most likely you would lose power during switchover, um, but that actually leads into another issue that this system could potentially experience. So what is that issue? Um, contact timing. So in a double pull, double throw switch, um, as I've you know, learned recently, there are two types of 
contact timing, something called make before break and break before make, or shorting versus non-shorting. What that means is in a make before break configuration, it means that as you switch those poles over, you will actually make contact with the other set of poles before you break contact with the original set, meaning the two poles will be shorted together. In break before make, it's the opposite. You know, you, you let go of your connection before you make the new connection. Um, the problem there is that if a switch that you are using is make before break, either on purpose or by accident, there is a chance that you will short your two power supplies together, potentially having the higher voltage supply feed the lower voltage supply, which is dangerous. Um, and in most cases, that would mean that the wall power would feed into the output of the battery. So we can't have it work that way. Um, the other issue is that if we're using a switch here, we need to make sure that the switch is rated for uh, DC current. Um, you'll see a lot of switches are rated for high voltage AC and high current AC. Um, but for actual DC applications, those ratings are actually much lower. And you usually have to go into slightly more specialized switches. I have a nice switch already picked out for this, so it's not as much of a problem, but it's something worth uh, pointing out. So, as far as this system is concerned, there is one way to solve for a problem like this. And that is to use, well, essentially, diode O-ring. Um, what that means is that we place Schottky diodes in line with each power supply. Um, Schottky diodes will only conduct in one direction after a forward voltage drop, so that in case there is a short between either of those supplies, uh, you won't be able to reverse conduct across the Schottky diode. Um, so that's the good news. And also, a, in a configuration like this, you wouldn't even need a switch. Technically, the switch is kind of just our on and off switch. You know, you can actually have no switch and just have the diodes um, basically act as an O-ring circuit. You know, either A or B or both, and one will not feed into the other. Um, so the issue with this, and this is one thing I wanted to consider for a while, but the issue with this is that by placing a Schottky diode in line with at least the battery power, um, and the wall power as well, we're going to be looking at about um, more than more than 400 millivolts of voltage drop across the Schottky diode, um, probably 600 plus, um, or so I'm just spitballing here because I, I barely looked into this, but um, it will reduce the battery's output below 4.8 volts, which is worse than it was in power pass-through mode, which essentially removes this as an option to use. Um, which is a shame, because I thought this could have been a quick and dirty solution to the problem. So, um, yeah. yeah, so that's out of the uh, question. So what is a way to get around the voltage drop issues with diodes like this and still have the similar functionality for the system? Well, you can use, you can replace their diodes in the system with something called ideal diodes. Now, I will point out that as we get into something like this, we're getting a little bit out of my wheelhouse here, or further out of my wheelhouse. So I'm going to keep this brief, because this was a solution that I looked into for a little bit, almost considered trying to lay out my own PCB to get one of these to work, until I found a better solution. So let's just take a quick, quick, uh, a brief glance at these, because they're very interesting system, or ways to solve this problem. So what is an ideal diode? It basically means that we take a MOSFET, and use a little bit of logic to control whether it is turned on or off. Um, and at that rate, the MOSFET's voltage drop, or a MOSFET's voltage drop, is only in the millivolt range, um, from around 20 millivolts, I think, is spec for a lot of these uh, chips shown, which are from a company called Analog Circuits, I believe. Um, so yeah, um, these are ubiquitous chips. I think they're used in a lot of devices. There are a lot of options um, for chips like this, you know, to handle different types of power supply configurations, types of output configurations, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, shown here in on this slide is a pretty simple version of one of these chips that I was looking at using. Uh, essentially, you have a wall adapter input and a battery input. Um, the battery input is controlled by that MOSFET shown in the center. Um, and so its gate is controlled by the LTC4412 chip. And there is a sense line on there. So what that sense line does is that it compares the voltage levels at um, its sense input versus the VIN um, pin from the battery. If the sense input's voltage goes higher than the battery, then the MOSFET is turned off and the wall input is selected as the main input for the system. So it's a way to choose between those two types of inputs. And I even think the diode can be replaced for the wall adapter um, the diode can be replaced with another set of this logic chip and MOSFET. So it's a way to, again, essentially select between these two supplies, 
uh, avoid reverse conduction, um, and uh, yeah, and get what we essentially what we'd want out of the system. The only problem is again, it requires a custom circuit, which I think is kind of out of the scope for our little project. Um, I don't want people having to either wire up one themselves, especially because these are only available in in uh, surface mount packages. Um, and the other thing is that it is most of these only control for power path, um, and they require more circuitry for charging, um, protection, enable functionality, all kinds of that stuff. So a system that was going to use this was going to get pretty complex pretty quick. Um, and luckily, well, luckily for me, and I guess for this project, I uh, I finally figured out what or finally figured out the correct thing to do, which was to just look at how other people did it. Um, you know, there are a lot of great uh, cyber deck builds out there, and a lot of them seem pretty power hungry. So I finally decided to look under the hood at someone else's build and take a look at how they power their system. And as luck would have it, there already is a great solution out there, um, especially ones that are great for pairing with Raspberry Pis that can work really well for this system. And what is that solution? I got three little letters for you. UPS. But not this UPS. This UPS. Uh, UPS in this case standing for uninterruptible power supply. So what is an uninterruptible power supply? Well, it's mostly there in the name, although the name might be a little overly optimistic. Uh, really what this is, is essentially a um, redundant power supply uh, meant to give a system, um, you know, two or maybe even more sets of options for power and the ability to seamlessly transition from your primary power source to your secondary power sources if your primary were to fail, um, which is where the uninterruptible comes from. So, you know, these are used in tons of applications with tons of different form factors. Um, what we're looking at here is called the Pi Uptime 2.0. Um, and this is um, among a small set of UPSs built specifically for the Raspberry Pi. So yeah, um, after looking at a couple CyberDeck builds online, you know, they seem to be used in uh, quite a few of them. And after digging around and finding this one and a few other ones, I was pretty impressed. These seem to have the options that I need for uh, for this build. So let's uh, let's dig into this a little bit more. So again, it's uninterruptible. So what does that mean? Um, this system has two main sources of power for it. It has your main uh, voltage in, which I'm going to call wall power from this point forward. That's your external power applied to this. And then again, and beyond that, there is battery power as your backup. So in this case, the batteries are... Uh, 18650 uh, sized lithium ion batteries, so they're 3.7 volts. So this system here has a uh, boost regulator on there to step that up to 5.2 volts. And um, and again, our other main power is the uh, voltage in from the side here. So if the main power is pulled, then this system will seamlessly switch over from supplying wall power to your system to supplying the stepped up battery power. Um, so yeah. Again, that actually satisfies, if we go back to one of the earlier slides, that satisfies one of the main things we wanted from this, uh, for the system, which is the ability to seamlessly transition from wall power to battery power and back again. And I've tested this out and so far it works pretty dang well. Um, beyond that, so what other features were we looking for? We're obviously looking for the ability to charge and this system will charge lithium ion batteries, um, which is good. It has a charging circuitry built into it with protection circuitry and stuff. So we're good to go there. Um, the, there's power pass through. So when we're feeding in wall power, we're feeding wall power directly into the system. And at the same time, we're also charging the battery. That means the wall power is going to pull double duty at that point. I think the charging rate on this is one amp, which is pretty good. That means our wall power supply doesn't need to be gargantuan in order to power both the system and charge the batteries at the same time. And then the total output power for this is rated at about two and a half amps, which I think is nearly perfect or perfect size for the amount of current we need to draw for the system total. The other nice features that this thing has uh, after researching it into it is, um, well, first of all, it's got a full GPIO header. So if you want it to, you can actually stack this right on top of the Raspberry Pi. Um, that would have actually been pretty nice to do in this uh, design. But after trying to check in for spacing, I determined that this whole assembly is going to be too tall. Um, not really the end of the world. It would have been cool to open up a lot of space in the corner of the unit to potentially do some other wild stuff. Uh, maybe try it in the future. Who knows? But for now, I'm actually going to be putting this off on its own. Um, but that's fine because we can actually connect it to the GPIO header on the Raspberry Pi using a little header cable. 
because this will actually feed five volts to the five volt and ground pins over here. Um, so we can feed those directly to the Raspberry Pi. So the Pi will have its own dedicated power output. And then going through the rest of the system, there actually is, you know, there's a couple of nice features on this that I like. Um, so we've got a little jumper here. that's actually the an enable pin for the system. Um, so when the jumper is off, it won't feed uh, power out. And when the jumper is on, it will. Uh, one of the sad things about this is I thought this enable pin, when I was reading through it online, was for the entire power output. But from what I can see, it only seems to shut off power to the GPIO pins for the Raspberry Pi. The remaining power remains on if this jumper is off or not. So it's not perfect, um, but it can be worked with. So I think my plan is going to be to feed a button to this, and then the output power will go through its own dedicated circuit on the button. It's uh, or the switch. So not perfect, but it does the job. There is a, a jumper here to set battery chemistry. It can do lithium ion or lithium ion. Iron phosphate, I believe, is the other chemistry. Um, luckily, this was preset to lithium ion because I forgot to check this when I plugged my batteries in. So that saved me a little disaster. Um, don't be like me. Read the instructions before you toy around with anything like this. Other great feature that I like on here is a set of uh, breakout pins over here, or um, you know, breakout through holes. Whatever. So they offer uh, I2C communication, so you can actually check battery status and such from here. Um, you get the uh, voltage out from the from the stepped up voltage from the either the batteries or the power pass through. So whatever voltage is being fed out of this system, you can get on those two uh, holes there. You can get the battery voltage. Uh, you can either feed that in or check it um, if you want. And then you can actually feed voltage in from here. So you can do everything that you would do on these connectors over here. You can hard solder right to these two points. I think I'll be using these in the build. And then finally, we have some dedicated connectors for the same purposes. So there's USB-C and USB micro for voltage in. There's a set of um, LEDs here that can give you whether the uh, UPS is on. Um, so if the UPS is on, that means that you're actually stepping up the voltage and feeding it out to the system. There's no wall power plugged in. So there's a dedicated LED for that. There's a charging LED, which is green when charging and off when not. Um, there is a low voltage LED, which will tell you if the voltage out drops below a certain threshold. There's, a, uh, there's another LED on there. There's a fault LED. Not exactly sure what that does. And then there's a jumper, which you can use to turn those LEDs on or off. Or, um, beyond that, there's another USB micro. This is the voltage out. So this will either be power pass through or the stepped up voltage from the batteries. And finally, a little uh, terminal block here. Um, this actually has a 3.3 volt regulator on it, which will give you uh, 700 milliamps worth of 3.3 volt power, which is pretty nice. So, yep, that is our uninterruptible power supply. So... Overall, this looks like it's going to do a great job. I've already gotten a chance to turn the system on, and it seems to be powering the system with a Raspberry Pi 3 in it without getting any low voltage warnings out of it. So that's really good. Um, personally, so some of the, not issues, but you know, just some of the disappointments here, and this is always the thing with buying off-the-shelf components for a project, is that they're always about 95% of the way there with some little hiccups. Um, because I'm not putting this on top of the Raspberry Pi, I have this giant stack header I need to worry about. So... It's just kind of a pain in the butt. It means this is going to sit higher than it actually needs to inside of the case. Um, excuse me. Um, but overall, it just means that I'm going to buy some, I'm going to add some uh, standoffs for all these four points in order to even that up. Uh, beyond that, it was a shame that this enable header does not control the entire power output, only for the Raspberry Pi. But again, we can get around that pretty easily. Um, and really, that's about it. Overall, it seems to be a pretty good package. Again, this is the Pi Uptime 2.0, so um, my initial impressions with it are pretty good. There are other uh, units out there, one from a company called Geekworm, which, if I remember correctly, has an insane 8-amp uh, output capacity. A um, little overkill for this project, and it was not It was only available from overseas. So this one was Amazon Prime to me in a couple days, and I'm impatient, so I went with this one. Um, the other thing was that it had three, the, the Greek worm had a three amp charging capacity, which meant that it was going to blow through whatever wall wart I was using to uh, power the system. So it seemed a little overkill, but I think their form factors are almost exactly the same. And this is probably a similar form factor to other uninterruptible power supplies out there. Basically, same board outline as the Raspberry Pi, same mounting hole positions, and a stacked header. Um, so... If you get a different one for this build, you might actually be able to incorporate it right into the casework with very minimal changes. It'll probably wire up a little bit differently, but overall that's about it. 
So the other half of this is the batteries. Um, I'm going to be brief about these batteries. This is actually the first project I've ever worked with 18650 batteries in. Um, these came from, uh, well, pretty good battery supplier, actually. I think it was 18650 store or something like that. Um, they were cheap. They came fast. These are from Epic Batteries. These are 3,500 milliamp hour, uh, 3.7 volt uh, rechargeable lithium ion batteries. And I think they have a 10 amp uh, maximum discharge capacity. So, yeah, let's just... Uh, before we end this episode, let's plug this whole system together and give it a try real quick. So first, let me pull off this header because this time I'm actually reading the instructions unlike I did the first time. So we're going to remove the header, set the battery chemistry correctly, which is good. Protected batteries. Protected batteries will not fit in these holders. So apparently this uh, battery package 18650 with extra protection circuitry will be a little bit taller and usually will not fit in these holders. So if you're going to buy... Uh, lithium ion batteries for this application and also let me hold them in the correct orientation um, Keep an eye out for that and Finally what else we got here ensure both batteries are fully charged or have the same amount of charge before you insert them I got lucky on that regard. I think these were at the same level of charge, but I did not read those instructions before I started um, Insert batteries properly and then mount the UPS on the Raspberry Pi so insert batteries properly we have plus on there which would match up to plus inside of there. So, and I think this will run off one or both batteries. So once I drop this battery in, you see the blue LED turn on, meaning that the UPS is running now. The voltage is being stepped up and we have, have 5.2 volts at the output. Now both batteries are in, that should give us uh, 7,000 milliamp hour of capacity. So first let's see what the output voltage is. Let's give it a quick check so y'all can see the the voltmeter here. I'm just gonna check. There's the out ground and voltage. So yeah, we have 5.25 or 5.23 volt coming out of the uh, or on the output from the battery. So this is the 3.7 volts of the battery is being stepped up to five and a quarter volt, which is good. So let's give this a try. So we can power up from here. So let's. Plug HDMI into the Raspberry Pi. I think this is running Raspbian right now, so it'd be a nice, slightly more power hungry operating system to, to check. So again, I'm gonna feed the the power from the GPIO over to the Raspberry Pi. Um, so this is the way I intend to do it, just using a four pin header. So just plug those pins in on the end. Make sure red is the bottom left corner. Make sure those match up. And I think we should get power. Actually, we won't get power on this just yet because I still have the, or I don't have the jumper on. So if I plug in the jumper, that's it. We have power output. So the Pi is booting up. Uh, we don't have a screen yet. I need to plug that in. So just for that purpose right now, I've had a, I have a little old cable I built in, built up previously to break out a USB cable. And I have a micro to standard USB adapter. So let's try that real quick. And if this doesn't turn on, I am not reshooting this video. So bear with me. Ah, there we go. So that's the system booted up with a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, and yeah, as you can see, there's no low power indicator. Um, Let's try to put this through its paces real quick. At least try a couple things. One thing I found is that turning on the internet, um, and we have Wi-Fi on as well. So, you know, we have some power hungry peripherals um, working on the Pi 3 right now. So let's plug in a mouse, a little laser mouse. So that's working on the screen right now. I might not be able to see it. Um, let's turn on the internet. And let me see if the voltage on the output line has dropped at all. So your V out right now is, it's 5.2. Really not bad. Um, so this is, this has pretty good capacity. I mean, we are now drawing probably roughly an amp out of this system and we've only, the power supply itself has only dropped 50 millivolt. So that's good steady power to the Raspberry Pi. Um, and we can also check the power roughly at the display by checking these pins right here. One, 
and two, don't short them. So that's four and three quarter. That's kind of low for the display. I don't know what the voltage of this display threshold is, but one thing I can say is that the wiring over here is messy, as you can see. You know, we're going from an adapter to across one connector into the adapter, across another connector into this cable. Um, then we're wiring to this board, going across this board into a screw terminal, through a screw terminal, into uh, this header connection. So um, I can say in the actual build, you know, when you build this up, make sure that you delete this entire cable and this interface. There should be a direct, almost a direct connection from the, uh, the UPS right to the connector for the board. But, yep, and let's try one more peripheral. Let's get a keyboard running as well. So one thing I've yet to do is check the battery life on this, but again, it's 7,000 milliamp hour, um, and usually the step or step up voltage is usually pretty consistent all the way throughout. So let's see, I think we have a keyboard running. One other thing worth checking in a minute is going to be let's try the high IDE. Bring it down a little bit so y'all can see it. Okay. Yeah, keyboard's working. Run a script. Boom. All right. Um, so that's all running right now. So that means our battery circuit is installed and running and is running a Raspberry Pi 3 uh, with no brownouts at the moment. You know, no low power uh, warnings or anything like that. No screen flashing. So that's great. The other thing to check real quick, and you know, it's always a little little rough with this, systems like this, is that. You gotta see how the power pass through does. So what that means is I'm now gonna plug in wall power from a two and a half amp supply um, right into the power input for the system. So we should, the screen might blank out, I've seen that before, but I think the, the Pi does not lose power at that point. So we should see the power switch over from the batteries to directly to the wall supply. So now we're taking power directly from the wall. You can actually see the green LEDs on now on the UPS, meaning it's charging the batteries, so not drawing power from the batteries. And the system is still on. Um, let's see what the voltage output is now. Let's see if it's changed at all. I think it's a little bit lower in power pass through mode. Whoop, I'm gonna go short, I'm gonna short this thing out of this, right? Yeah, it's 5.16. So, yep. Overall, besides for having to check the um, entire on time I can get out of this system, this seems like a pretty good solution. Um, it's giving us, we're going to be able to enable it using um, probably the same, or this connector here, actually. This is a uh, little double pole, double throw slide switch that I was going to use in the uh, old idea that I talked about previously. Um, but it has good high amperage capacity for DC. So I'll use this one half of it I'll use to switch that jumper to turn the Raspberry Pi on and off. The other half I will use to directly power on and off the rest of the system, whatever else is coming out of this. So there's our enable for the system. There's our battery power. There's our wall pass through. We have charging. We have almost everything we need. All we gotta do is get it into the system. And luckily, we'll probably go through this in the next episode, but I've already got a whole new uh, rear cap printed that's going to mount the Raspberry Pi as well as the uninterruptible power supply. So, look out in the future. That's the next thing I'm going to do. We'll hopefully have it up quickly. Um, we'll be going through that build, which should hopefully wrap this up. And then, probably even regardless, we should wrap this up. And then I will get those files online. So, yep. Uh, see you in the next episode.